Hello, and something a little bit different this week, given that it's a Grand Prix weekend and it's a bank holiday in the UK here at least, I thought it would be interesting to explore racing lines and a procedural generation of racing tracks. And this video is a little bit unusual because I don't really have a solution as such. Instead, what I've done is create a framework to allow me to experiment and play with different strategies to determining an optimal racing line for a given type of AI, for example. And so this is what I've created. So I've got a uh, track uh, in the console game engine, of course, and the track has a car going around it. Now, the, the car going around it is purely an aesthetic thing. It's not moving at a particular speed. It's just going around it to show the direction. And what this tool allows me to do is position the track uh, with different types of curvature and bend. So I can basically draw my own tracks by moving these nodes. And of course, I'm using the splines uh, that we generated ooh, about a year ago now uh, to do this. Uh, so if you've not seen the splines videos, I suggest you go and watch them beforehand. Although it's not strictly necessary. Even though we're using splines to do this, it doesn't really uh, require you to understand how the splines work in order to do these things. And here, in a clearly shameless act of self-promotion, uh, here is exactly those videos. So this was a Programming and Using Splines Part 1, where we really discussed the mathematics of behind the spline and how it works. And then uh, Programming and Using Splines Part 2 looked at how we can make the splines interactive and have objects that move around them. So if you haven't worked out already, the track is simply a spline. Um, I've added some mouse control to it to make it a little bit more interactive. But what I can do is uh, try to predict a racing line. So here we've got a blue line, which is the racing line, going around the track, and at the moment it stays in the middle of the track. Uh, but I can evolve a solution. Now this particular strategy uh, aims to have the longest straights that it can get around the track, under the assumption that that particular AI has a car that's really, really fast uh, in a straight line, perhaps and we can undo the evolution. So we can, we can determine how much uh, we want to apply based on how much effort we want to put in solving it. And this, of course, can be done as a pre-processing step. It doesn't need to be done in real time like this, uh, so we could spend a lot of time trying to compute the most optimal line and then load that into the game. I'll also mention at this moment, I don't have a game planned for this. This really is just me uh, trying some experiments. What's also nice though, because it is real time, is I can manipulate the track and the racing line changes dynamically too. And so we can see, is it making somewhat sensible decisions? So even though the track is moving quite wildly here, the racing line isn't changing too much. But if we start to make the track uh, very challenging, we can start to see that the racing line doesn't make as much sense. There are other strategies too, so this strategy attempts to find the minimum path around the track. And that seems to work quite nicely, so you can see it maintains a straight line uh, through this chicane, but I can force it uh, into requiring a curve here. Let's have a look on the, uh, the back straight. Same sort of thing. A slightly different approach is to try and find the path of least curvature around the track. So we try to make all of the curves as uh, oblique as possible. I was going to say acute accidentally there, but then that would have defeated the purpose of my argument. And we'll look at ways that we can combine all of these approaches to give us different strategies. So you could imagine different race cars on this track uh, employing a different racing line strategy to give it some sort of compelling character of its own. As I said at the start, I don't have an ideal solution for this. This really is just me messing around. But I've discovered some interesting techniques along the way and some of the limitations that splines present. My racetrack is going to be represented as a series of nodes linked together with a continuous spline, the type that we've developed in earlier videos, the Catmill ROM spline. And uh, I'm just going to uh, quickly draw out a simple track here. So the idea of this spline is it joins all of the nodes in a nice curvy way, more or less. Something like that. Now to generate a track, what I'm going to do is extrude from each node uh, both left and right hand sides of this central path. And so to do that, I'm going to calculate the gradient at that point on the spline. And then normal to the gradient, I'm going to step out a particular distance. And we'll call this distance my track width. And I'm going to do that for all of the nodes. On the left hand side of the track, I'm going to use these new positions as nodes for a second spline. And likewise, 
I'll do the same for the right hand side of the track. This approach allows me to use a single control spline along the middle, a variable called track width, to determine uh, the track boundaries. Let's just quickly code this up using the existing spline code, and we'll also add some mouse control to it too. As I'm sure you'll all be accustomed to by now, I'm starting a project by including the OLC console game engine. I've created a class one lone coder racing line, uh, which inherits from uh, console game engine and overrides the on user create and on user update functions. In my int main for my C program, I simply create an instance of this class and I call a construct console function to create a console which is 256 characters wide, 240 characters high, and each character is going to be four by four pixels. That's quite a high resolution. The first thing I want to do though is bring in the spline class that we created for the spline videos. So this required uh, this structure S.2D and the class itself, which I'm just going to cut and paste. The class did get quite large, but on the whole, it's pretty much the same. I have made one small change, and that is I've told the spline to draw itself. Whereas in the previous videos, uh, we drew the spline in the onUser update function. To start with, I'm going to create a single spline called path, which is going to be our control path. And I'd like our path to consist of 20 nodes. In the onUser create function, I'm going to use a little for loop to iterate through all 20 nodes and add them to the path in a circular fashion. I'm going to use a little bit of modern C to add these without needing to construct them all individually. And so the code simply uses the position of where we are in the loop. Uh, I've fixed the radius at 30 here. Uh, it uses the position with the nodes and times it by pi times 2 uh, using sine and cos to work out the position around the circumference of the circle. And we'll use the screen width and screen height functions to give us the midpoint of the screen. I've made another small change to the spline class. I've added the function update spline properties which the user can call at any time to go and work out the lengths of the spline and the spline segments. In the onUser update function, I'm going to clear the screen to all green pixels. This looks like grass. And I'm going to tell the control path spline to draw itself. And I'll use a little auto for loop to iterate through all of the points on that path uh, to draw a small rectangle around them. This shows us where the nodes are. Let's take a look. Perfect. I want to be able to use my mouse to pick a node and move it around the screen. So I'm going to add a variable, uh, an integer called selected node. I'll set it to minus one as a default. That means we've got no node selected. In the onUser update function, I'm going to check to see has the mouse button been pressed. And if it has, I'm going to iterate through all of the nodes on the control path, calculate the distance between the node on the path and the mouse position, and if that distance is less than five pixels, I'm going to capture the selected node and break from this loop so I don't test any further nodes. The mouse is of course now in a held down state, but it can be released. And if it is released, I don't want to select any nodes anymore. So I'm going to select the selected node to minus one again. But if the mouse is held down and the selected node is not minus one, then I'm going to position the points that selected on the path to be wherever the mouse coordinate is. And given that this action can change the nature of the path, I'm going to update the spline every time it's moved. Let's take a look. So now I can select a node with my mouse cursor and move it around manually. This is a bit easier than we did in previous videos where we would highlight the node and use the keyboard uh, to move it around. This is very nice. I think I'll use this code a lot in the future. Now that we have a control path, uh, we're going to need to define the track boundaries, the left and the right. So I'm going to create two more splines called track left and track right. In this application, these splines are going to be updated on every frame update. But in the onUser create function, I'm going to give them some values just so that they're the correct size. So in the loop where I'm allocating nodes, I'm just going to push back a zero, zero. I'll do that for left and I'll do that for right. We'll just also update the onUser update function to draw these two splines. And 
that's the left and the right. The uh, zero, 00 at the end of these functions, by the way, is a camera offset. Uh, you might have seen in some of my more advanced videos, such as the Jario platform game uh, and the most recent RPG series, that uh, drawing things relative to the camera allows me to pan and scroll across the screen. I'm not using that for this video, but I feel that these might be useful uh, arguments to have in a function for any object that draws itself. So after all of the potential for the control path to have been altered, let's generate now the track boundaries. I'm going to assume that my track width is uh, going to be 10 pixels. Now this is width either side of the uh, control spline, so I guess this is actually track half width. And given that we know that our boundary splines have the same number of points as our control spline, uh, we can use a for loop to iterate through all of the points in the control spline and amend the boundary splines as necessary. So for each control point in our spline, I'm going to get its physical location and its gradient. And to keep things tidy, I'm going to normalize the gradient vector. Don't forget, an S point 2D is an X and Y uh, two-dimensional coordinate. And we can construct the boundary splines in the following way. Let's take the X coordinate of the left-hand side of the track to start. We know that the boundary splines are relative to the control splines. So we'll start by accessing the properties directly. So we'll take the X position of that point on the control spline. And from that, I want to add to it F track distance away, a vector in the direction of the normal to the gradient. So to get the normal, we want to invert the gradient. So in this case, it's a minus g1 dot y, and we'll normalize it by dividing by the length of the gradient vector. And we can do the same for the uh, left boundary y coordinate set, except this time it's not minus g1 dot y, it's g1 dot x. Don't forget, this is the normal, which is 90 degrees to the gradient. And we can use exactly the same code for the right-hand side, except this time, instead of Adding the track width, we subtract it. So let's take a look. Well, there we go, that looks promising so far. And if I pick up a control point, we can see that the boundary splines uh, always try to stay surrounding the control path. Well, here's one of the things we start to notice about the limitations of splines. The width of the track doesn't remain consistent. And that's because we don't have any information about what's happening between the nodes on the splines. There's actually not very much I can do about this, it's just the nature of the beast. But what we can do is carefully position control points as and where they're necessary. So if we've got uh, areas of high frequency along the track where there's lots of different curvature, we're going to need lots of points, i.e. we're going to attribute more information to those regions of the track. This is different, however, than when we've got long straight sections where we don't need anywhere near as much information. So in this region I'm using more points and in this long more boring region I'm using fewer points. This has the effect of on the whole keeping the track width relatively consistent. At the moment the track isn't very cosmetically appealing, it's just two white lines, it should be filled in to look like a track. And this is a little bit of an aside in this video because it's nothing to do with the splines, but it highlights an interesting feature I've added to the console game engine, and that's the ability to draw triangles, something we will use and abuse, no doubt, I'm sure, a lot in the future. So, in the simplest sense, one could simply draw a triangle between uh, adjacent points of the outer track boundary splines. So, for example, I could take this point and draw a triangle up to here, draw a triangle to here, and uh, I could fill it in or leave it wireframe. So we could extract a triangle that way, and of course we can have a corresponding triangle by doing the same with the existing point. And fill that in. The downside is that triangles have straight edges. So even though I know that all of these are valid triangles, the track is going to look a bit clunky. Instead, what I'm going to do, and one of the reasons that we have created this boundary spline, is I'm going to subdivide the spline into little steps. And so this allows me to approximate the track with a lot more accuracy. So I can create a triangle there, and create a triangle there. And create a triangle there, and there, there, and there, there, and there. And as you can see, it follows the curvature of the track 
a lot more accurately. We pay the price in performance though because there's more calculations and there's more things to draw. So let's add some code to draw the track. I'm going to start uh, by defining a resolution uh, at what we'll draw the track to. So at the moment it's set to 1, so this will draw a single triangle pair between every uh, set of nodes. So I'm going to create a for loop to do this, but instead of being an integer for loop, it's a floating point for loop. A little bit unusual. And you should be careful when using floating point for loops just in case your conditions don't work out the way you think they should. And this means I can extract four points related to this location on the spline. So this is the control spline going along the middle. Um, I can get, first of all, point one on the left hand side, and I'll also get something I'll call point one on the right hand side for location t. I know that t plus one step of my resolution will give me point two, and I'm going to get those on the left and right hand side as well. And one of the new features I've added to the console game engine is the ability to draw a triangle. And in this case, drawing a triangle just draws it as uh, the three boundary lines. So I pass in the three coordinate pairs, and I specify what I want it to look like and the colour. And for each uh, pass through this loop, we do of course need to draw two triangles. And you'll notice that these pairings are not quite the same. So this will draw as I've just done in these slides. So let's take a look. Well, very nice. So we can see that the spline has been approximated uh, with each node getting a pair of triangles between it. It all looks a bit untidy because our boundary uh, splines at the moment are very smooth. We allocate a great deal of uh, time and effort in computing those uh, smooth splines. But the approximation, uh, which are effectively these two-dimensional polygons, uh, doesn't quite line up. So just to show this a little bit more visibly, I'm going to remove the boundary splines temporarily. There we go. So if I pull out now a couple of points, we can see it gets a bit angular. The control spline is in the middle, but the track looks a little bit chunky. No matter, because we specified a resolution coordinate. And I'm going to set this to be something quite small, uh, approximately 20% of uh, the distance between two nodes uh, should be allocated triangles. So now it looks a, a lot denser but the outer boundary is suddenly much smoother. And so we've generated a triangle strip, and I'm sure some of the 3D graphics fanboys will be getting very excited, and yes, 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 we will be looking at this in a future video. Drawing the wireframe outline of a triangle is very simple. You're just drawing straight lines, which we've been able to do for some time, between two points. Uh, I have, however, added to the console game engine the ability to draw filled triangles, and this uses a uh, Bresnum implementation of the triangle fill routine. I'm not going to go into the details of this because it is uh, very, very obvious from Wikipedia how this is implemented, and I've literally just cut and pasted. And now, of course, the results are much more compelling and a lot more fun, and this gives me loads of ideas for interesting future videos we can do. Anyway, I'm making a big mess of this track, I wouldn't like to drive around it. Now that we've handled the cosmetic side of drawing the track, let's talk about how we're going to handle the racing line. And I want to take the approach where I can store the racing line using the same number of nodes that I'm using to store the track. And this is very important, because what I should be doing is using more nodes. And the reason for that will become clear in a minute when I explain the algorithm and how we're going to do it. But effectively, what we're going to do is along the normal of each point on the control path, I'm going to store an additional variable. I'm going to call it displacement. And what this means is somewhere along this normal, which is, of course, the track width uh, in length times two, uh, I'm going to have a unique value which describes how far along here do I need to go from the middle. So the displacement at the middle is uh, zero, and the displacement at the end of here is track width. So my displacement value gives me an indication of whereabouts on this vector do I place a node. And so depending on whatever the algorithm comes up with, uh, I'm going to end up with an array of displacements which tells me where to position the nodes of an additional spline which we'll call the racing line. So I might have one where there's a node placed here, and then a different one here, 
and then here, and here perhaps, and here because we're going around the apex, you want to hug the corner. But at this point, perhaps we want to go through it, and maybe to here again to hug this corner again. So our racing line doesn't necessarily have to look like the control path, but it will be bounded because the displacement component can't go beyond the track width. Oh, I've gone the wrong way there, that should be going up there, we're crossing the tracks, so it's trying to keep some sort of a straight line. Now the second part to note is that I want to evolve my racing line towards a solution. It's not something you can do in a single pass. So for each frame update, uh, I'm going to assume that my racing line is at the same position as my control spline. But then I'm going to slightly alter the displacement values uh, per iteration of evolution in an attempt to get this system to converge to a stable solution. That will all become much clearer when we start looking at some code for it. First things first, I'm going to need an additional spline, the racing line. And I don't know how many iterations of evolution I'm going to need, but let's set a counter variable for them anyway. And I'll need an array to store my displacements. Now I could go and create a specific type of class to do this where this information is stored along with the XY coordinate of the spline, but I've not. And once we've drawn the track, that's where I'm going to start calculating this evolution. And given that I want it to be animatable, uh, as you saw at the beginning of this video, uh, I need to do this by specifying that the racing line is reset uh, per frame update. And we'll reset it by making it equal to the control path. And we must also not forget to reset the displacement values too. And whenever we've made any substantial changes to a spline, we need to update the spline properties. This resets all of the length calculations of the spline segments. So I'll need two nested for loops to do this. The first is going to be the number of iterations of evolution that we apply. And the second is going to go through each of the points along the racing line. Uh, it's going to alter them. But it's not going to alter the racing line spline directly. Instead, the result of this for loop is going to set the displacement values. We then need to take those displacement values and turn them into uh, the points for the racing line spline. So we have a second for loop which goes through them again. Now, the reason we're not doing this in the original for loop is that we don't want to update all of the spline points sequentially because we might have some global information or points that are further away feeding into our algorithms. In much the same way that we did with the cellular automata, we can't update all of the cells individually. Uh, we need to update everything simultaneously. So for a given point along the racing line spline, I'm going to look at its displacement values and make sure that they lie within the boundaries of the track. If they don't, then I'm going to clamp them to be within the boundaries of the track. And in a very similar way that we created the original track boundaries, I can calculate the displaced node for the racing line. I grab the gradient of the control path at a given point, the same point along the overall path where our racing line will be, and I've normalized it. And whereas before we set the track boundaries left and right, this time uh, I'm going to set the racing line uh, point uh, X and Y in exactly the same way. So you can see here I'm taking the normal uh, based upon it, uh, inverting the gradient and using the displacement value to offset it along that normal. Now we have a general purpose framework for manipulating these displacement points in a safe way and it'll draw it all to the screen. I will add one more little bit of user input, and that is to use the A and S keys to change the number of iterations that we apply to our algorithm. I'll also make sure that the number of iterations doesn't go below zero. All that's left to do is to actually draw the racing line. So we'll draw this after we've drawn the path, but before we draw the nodes. We'll update the spline properties of the racing line, just in case, and we'll tell it to draw itself in the color blue. Let's take a look. Well, right now it just looks like we've changed the control path to blue because we haven't done anything. The uh, racing line just mimics the control path. Well, I think the first thing we should try is finding the shortest path around the track. Here I have three control nodes uh, and I've drawn in some track boundaries. It doesn't quite all fit on the screen. So if we're looking for the minimum path around here and not knowing what the rest of this track looks like, we probably want something like this which means from our control path, we want to move this node downwards. Now we know we can get the normal relatively easily from a point, but we can also do it a separate way too. If we take a vector going this way from that node to that node, and a vector going this way from that node to that node, 
and add them, we will always get a vector that bisects them. In this case, it'll be pointing in this direction. If we look at the angle theta here, in order to uh, minimize the curvature and perhaps also find the shortest distance, we want to maximize this theta for every node. So when the node eventually ends up here and draw a line and draw a line, our theta is very wide indeed. Now don't forget, we'll be doing this for all nodes in the system. So we only want to move in little steps to allow the system to converge to a solution. So for my first proposal is that we will move the node a little step along this vector created by adding uh, the two uh, separate vectors to the left and right of a node. Now things are going to get a little bit vector heavy here and there'll be some of you screaming at the screen that this is the point I should have used a vector library. I know you've commented in the past. So to those that get excited about this sort of thing, I'm very sorry. I'm going to start by grabbing the points local to the, uh, the point that we're currently working with. So I've got the point in the middle, which is just the point that we're looking at straight away. And to the left and right, um, I'm grabbing those points too. But because my track is circular and my array containing those points is not, I need some uh, modulus arithmetic uh, trickery in order to emulate that circularity. If we assume right is in the positive direction, that's quite easily. We just take our index, add one, and uh, mod use the modulus symbol with the size of the array. That will wrap around to zero. Going left is a bit more tricky, because when you're using modulus with negative numbers, the results are not always what you expect. So to combat this, what I'm doing is adding the whole array size and subtracting one from it. So this ensures that my modulus arithmetic is still using positive numbers. You can look at this as being exactly the same as an overflow on an assembly language machine, for example. This will give me three points, one in the middle and one to the left and one to the right of my current point of interest. Creating vectors now is very simple because I simply subtract the left and right points from the middle point. I'm going to normalize these vectors because right now I don't think I care too much about the length. So I create two new vectors which are the normalized equivalents of my vector left and vector right. And finally, I'm going to sum those two vectors to give me my normal vector, and I'll normalize that too. So what I've just calculated is a vector somewhere along here of a particular length. However, this is a 2D thing, and my displacement value is a 1D thing. So I need to dimension crush, and I'm going to do that by uh, projecting this partial normal vector along the entire normal vector. And we'll use the dot product to do that. And so in this case, I'm taking my tangential vector so as we've seen many times by now, I'm going to get my full normal vector by taking the spline gradient and I'm going to normalize it. And then I'm going to project my uh, partial normal vector onto the full one. And using the uh, dot product there, I can just set the displacement directly. And I'm going to say that for this iteration, I want to increase my displacement value by the result of all of those vector equations uh, times by 0.3, which is a little bit of a tuning value. Let's take a look. So with no iterations of calculation, uh, we see that the uh, racing line in blue more or less follows the control path. As I add more iterations, we can see that the racing line starts to uh, reduce to find the shortest path around the track. I'll move these a little bit swifter. In fact, what I'm going to do is draw out a track uh, where these are already all pre-positioned and just save that information. So I don't have to do this each and every time. But we can see it's found the, shorting, uh, the shortest boundary sorry, uh, around the, uh, the track. Now with liberal use of the Visual Studio Debugger, I have managed to extract this set of coordinates as being a bit of an interesting track. Very nice. And so as I add iterations, like an elastic band, the racing line contracts to find the shortest valid path around the track a bit of a kink down here. And if we look at this part for as an example, uh, it's still a straight line. doesn't matter whereabouts on the track the vehicle goes, it's going to follow that path until I start to pull it a little beyond the track width. I like a little bit of animation in my videos, so I'm just going to use the code that we used in the splines part 2 video to put in a small model car that will just zip around the track. Remember the OLC uh, model format is basically a vector of pairs of floats uh, where each pair is a coordinate of a vertex on the car. 
My car is going to be an extraordinarily highly detailed model of a Formula One car, i.e. an isosceles triangle. And the last thing I'm going to draw, after we've drawn all of the points, is the car. And I'm using a variable called F marker to tell me where the car is around the track. And I'm just extracting its position and its gradient based on the racing line spline. And using the draw wireframe model command to draw it at that location, I can extract the rotation angle using the gradient and the ATAN2 function. I'm going to scale it by 4 and draw it in black. Sorry about the screen jumping around a bit there. The F marker variable is just a floating point value. And on each frame update, at some point, I'm just going to increase that uh, by a fixed amount. I'm going to check that it's not gone beyond the length of the racing spline uh, so it can wrap around. Let's just take a quick look to see if the car drives around. It does, there it goes. And as we adjust the racing line, the car also adjusts its trajectory. We've not looked at acceleration or deceleration or numerous other properties yet and I don't intend to in this video. But the biggest problem in trying to determine the racing line is that the shortest path is not necessarily the fastest path on a racing circuit. In order for the racing car to turn, it must lose energy. And so trying to find the path of minimum curvature is actually more important than trying to find the shortest path, or at least a fusion of the two techniques. And one of the advantages of this framework is I can explore a variety of different techniques. I don't necessarily have to just alter the current node I'm working on, I can alter my neighbouring nodes too. And so if I wanted to emphasise least curvature, I can tell my neighbours to move in the opposite direction to the one I've just moved. This way, the three nodes will try to line up in as straight a line as possible. And so that gives us a slightly different looking track. There's a bias towards having straight lines. And you can start to do some interesting things too. For example, if I invert the polarity of all of these things, I can start trying to find the longest way around a track. And this nicely highlights one of the limitations of this approach. This is the longest way given the information this system has to solve the problem. What we can effectively see is the car is attempting to zigzag along the track boundaries. But the zigzag is of quite a low frequency, in fact it's every other node, and that's because all it has got is the nodes to go off. If we had more nodes, we'd expect the zigzag to be a much higher frequency, because that would then be the longest distance around the track, just mindlessly going left to right to left to right to left to right to left to right all the way around. Given that this video was really just to present an intellectual curiosity, and not really any sort of usable solution, I'm going to leave that as an exercise for the user. What a cop-out. But I think it's certainly worth investigating higher resolution racing lines, uh, particularly for accurate minimum curvature estimation. If you've enjoyed this video, and I know I have because it's back to normal and we're back to regular length videos now, then please give me a big thumbs up. Have a think about subscribing and I'll see you next time. Take care.